It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Jane Van Dyke Perez. Uh, Jane is entering, it's hard to believe she doesn't look like she could be in her 26th year in this field. Uh, Jane has been in the uh, assisted living industry. She worked in uh, the corporate side, um, doing compliance, and um, is very astute with regulations. Uh, Jane grew up in Portland, Oregon, and had a grandmother with Alzheimer's disease. So she saw firsthand how Alzheimer's disease impacts not only the person, uh, but also the family. And it sort of led her to a passion for uh, helping uh, people with uh, dementia diagnoses. She started assisted living education along with her husband in 2009. And she spends her time teaching initial certification, that's the 40-hour course that administrators have to have, as well as the continuing education classes that administrators have to take. And it's my pleasure to teach with her. Uh, I teach for her as an independent contractor. So uh, the best part of introducing Jane is that I get to introduce a dear, dear friend, Jane Van Dyke Perez. before I could give her a hug. Oh, it's okay. I'll hug you from afar. Yes, my 26th year. If you get close to me, you'll see the wrinkles. From afar? Not bad. Um, I did grow up in Portland. I did grow up with my grandparents actually living with us. And I was a young teen when my grandparents moved in because my grandmother had, well, what, back, what they called back then was senility or hardening of the arteries. And I used to ask my grandma, Grandma, what did you do to make your arteries so hard? Because I don't, I don't want to do that. And, um, you know, back then, preteen, teenager, I didn't consider it a blessing to have my grandparents living with us. In fact, it was kind of a nuisance, I would say. Um, my grandmother had all of the different behavior issues that so many of our residents with dementia have. And pardon me, I'm just going to move this a little closer. So those are my bones, actually. <laughs> All right, I didn't even, okay, perfect. She had so many of the behaviors that a lot of our, our Alzheimer's residents have, like repetition, like not understanding it was the year 1983, okay? And we, what we did was we thought the best thing to do was reorient her constantly, okay? Um, she also had a lot of sundowning issues, and so, you know, it would be Thursday morning, 2 in the morning, we would wake up in the middle of the night and we'd smell smoke. And we'd go into the kitchen and say, Grandma, what are you doing? Well, it's, you lazy bones, you got to get up now, it's time to go to church. And she'd be making breakfast to go to church at Thursday at 2 in the morning. Almost burned the house down once. So it was hard for me to have my friends over sometimes because I, was, I wasn't ashamed of my grandparents I, I, or I, my grandmother. It just was, it was very difficult explaining that because back then, you know, 25, 30 years ago, we didn't really have associations like this. We didn't have discussions. We kind of hit grandma in the back room, you know. So I'm very happy to be here to talk to you about my experiences, not only with my grandparents, well, my experiences in 26 years of this industry, taking care of people with Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, like Pam said, I, am a, a, I was a corporate person, but what I did was um, I went out in the field and made sure that all of our communities ran properly, and I ran many of them. Back then, we didn't have memory care units like we have now. Um, that we know this is the wave of the future and so many of our larger communities now, smaller ones too, are putting in memory care units. So, I just want to get a show of hands here. Um, I'm going to see who my audience is today. Who here is in the assisted living field as like an administrator or an, or an owner of a property? Okay, small number. Who here is, is here because they take care of a loved one? Wow. Oh, bless you, ready? I know how that is, and that's a hard job. Put your feet up, you're on vacation right now, okay? For a little bit, unless you're worried what's going on at home. Um, do I have any nurses? Yeah, bless you also. Bless you also, okay. 
Simon? I'm going to start off with a story before I get into this, um, my, my, my talk about behavior challenges. Because in all of my 26 years, up until two days ago, I had never heard this story before. In, in two days, I've heard this story twice. I think it's God's way of telling me I need to share it. And it is, has to do with, with dementia residents. Um, starting out 26 years ago, I had a very wonderful woman that I worked with. Her name was Vicki Clark, and she went on to great success in many different companies. And this is something that happened to her. Um, she was out of property, and um, she went to go meet this woman who was extremely agitated. She was a resident there. She was very agitated. So Vicki stopped by to see how she was doing. And this woman said, well, I'm having this serious problem. The maintenance man, he keeps breaking into my apartment. And what he does is he opens my soup cans, he eats half of them, and then he seals them up again and puts them back. And, of course, this is probably an umpteenth person that she's told the story to. And everyone else has said, you're crazy, you're crazy, you're crazy, because no one can, you know, no one's breaking in here, no one's taking the soup out, no one's sealing it up again with their magic sealer and putting it back on the shelf. But Vicki knew, okay? So what Vicki did was, she says, you know what, I think I could help you with this problem. She says, can I, can I see the cans of soup? She says, well, well, yes. So she takes the cans of soup and she says, you know what, I'll be back later. I, I think I know what I can do about this. So she had all of these different types of soup, you know, cream of mushroom, and she had cream of broccoli and chicken noodle. And she went down to the store and she bought similar types of soup. Okay? And she came back to the woman and said, I think I've solved her problem. She says, you know, that maintenance director he has this obsess obsession with Campbell's soup. I found out. Campbell's soup. So guess what? I brought you Swanson's. And he doesn't like Swanson's. He's going to leave the soup alone. And she said, oh, that's fantastic. And guess what? Problem solved. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? And everyone else had told her she was crazy. Okay. I just, I just thought that was such a wonderful story and a lesson to be learned, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, there's room in the front, you guys, if you want to come join us in the front. No one wants to sit in the front. Right. Okay. So here's what we're going to do today for the next hour. Because I know I'm standing between you and lunch, so I promise I won't go over. Okay? Give me one second. There we go. Okay, we're going to talk about different issues that our residents with Alzheimer's and dementia might have, including aggressive behavior. Now, I have been kicked, hit, scratched, poked, all of the above. Yeah, we're going to talk about that. Okay? I think working with dementia residents sometimes it becomes a job hazard, but it's accepted. Okay? So we're going to talk about uh, aggressive behavior and wandering, eloping. To be very serious. I remember, let's see, is he in here? Good, I can talk about Bill now. Is he in here? Okay, all right. Um, my husband and I have formed this company. Now, I have spent my entire life in assisted living. He has not. In fact, I remember when I first tried to get him to come into my properties because he was on the finance and ownership side. He was kind of nervous. He says, I don't know. I get kind of nervous around old people. Why? What do you think they're going to do to you? Jump you? That was kind of crazy. Now he's great, but he was a little nervous. So I started, I came home one day and I talked about writing my elopement plan for Renaissance Senior Living. He's like, what? They run off and get married? Like, no, 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 honey. Laundering. Elopement. I said, but they do run off and get married too. And we're very happy about that. Yes. We're going to talk about care refusal. Why would someone not want to take a shower? I love taking a shower. Okay? Why would someone not want to take their medications? And what do we do when they don't want to take their medications? What do we do when they, when they um, don't want to shower? And then I'm going to give you, at the end, some important keys for caregiving, you know, when you're a caregiver, including how to communicate effectively, effectively with them. 
Now, Bill's father is 92, and he has Alzheimer's disease. He's in the latter stages. Okay? And so not only have I grown up with it in our house, but now I also have another um, family member with the disease. Okay, so please, please remember that every behavior has a reason. Our job is to find out what the reason is. Okay? People don't necessarily you know, walk around like this. There's a reason why they're hitting you. There's a reason why they're striking out or kicking you, okay? And don't label them. Oh, here comes Mildred. She's the biter. Oh, here comes Joe. He's the kicker, okay? My father-in-law lived one of my properties. Unbeknownst to my best friend, Virginia, she labeled him the grabber, okay? Um, he, he actually fell in his apartment, and he fell between the sink and or the vanity and the toilet, and he was kind of wedged down in there. And he wasn't hurt, he just needed to get, you know, he needed a little help up. And my friend Virginia is quite large, and he decided he was going to help get up by grabbing under her. Okay, so she came down to a meeting one day, and she says, oh, I met Mr. Perez upstairs, you know, the grabber. And I thought, Mr. Perez? They go, oh, no, I'm, I'm standing at the meeting going, no, 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 that's my, my father-in-law, and she had no idea it was my father-in-law she was talking about, so no labeling. They're not doing it on purpose, okay? So if you are a, an outside caregiver, if you work in an, an assisted living community or a skilled nursing facility, you need to interview the family about behavior issues, okay? Find out what did the family do when someone became aggressive, or, or decided that, that they didn't, or that they wanted to refuse care. What, what did they do, okay? You know what I always ask? What's their favorite flavor of ice cream? Now, why do you think that matters? Motivation, I call it bribery. Yes, that's a good one. I like the term motivation, I call it bribery. Um, and we'll talk about different techniques, you know, to get people to come back in your house and stuff when they, when they elope. It works when you know what their favorite cookie is, their favorite food, or their favorite ice cream flavor. And please have that available for them, okay? So ask them, what, what, what approach was the most successful and which one was the least successful, okay? Has the resident traditionally had a problem with certain caregivers, like male or female, okay? Now, Everyone has a little quirk. My father, my father-in-law has a couple. One of his is he will not accept food from a male. He will not accept food from a male. You know why? Kind of funny. Because males have hair on their arms. And the hair might go bing and go bing into the food, and there you go. So he will not accept food from a male. Now, so if, if, if I didn't tell the care staff where he lives that he wouldn't accept it, they would think that he was just being a, a, a crotchety old man or he's being difficult. Then they would label him Mr. Difficult, okay? When you think about our, the generation that we're working with, our seniors, okay, maybe they're not comfortable, the ladies, with a male caregiver. Maybe only a handful of people had seen them naked in their past, maybe their husband and their doctor. So it would be odd for them to be comfortable taking a shower with someone who is, is opposite sex. With that said, we have some phenomenal male caregivers. Okay, So it's all about um, what their preferences are. Okay, so here are some common reasons for aggressive or agitated behavior. Number one might be an unmet need, such as being hungry or being thirsty or having to go to the bathroom. Gosh, if you were walking past me all the time and ignoring me and I had to go to the bathroom and I was about to have an accident, I'd be yelling and screaming and being, waving my arms and being all agitated also. Okay, so think about that. What is their unmet need? Okay, pain. That's actually my number one. If the person was not aggressive or assertive uh, yesterday and today they are, what's the number one thing I think of? 
UTIs, urinary tract infections. Absolutely, the body's fighting off an infection, it's very painful, and sometimes the behaviors just come out. Okay? But it might even just be a headache, or it might be that they're uncomfortable where they're sitting. When I was a, when I grew up in Portland, and the reason why I've been in this industry for so long is because I uh, started high school early, I started college early, and not because I'm brilliant, that's nothing to do with it. It's because um, I was a gymnast, and I had a special school schedule and tutors because I traveled throughout the United States competing. And because of that, I have sciatica problems. And I have a lot of joint problems. I think my future is going to be arthritis, coming soon. And so I'm going to have to write all this stuff down for my kids to tell you guys when I move into your community. You know, don't let Jane sit too long. She has sciatic issues. Okay? So ask the families, if you're a caregiver, do they have any kind of pain issues or pain issues in the past, back issues? Okay? Loneliness. Absolutely. You know, sometimes uh, I see a lot of residents in wheelchairs around the nurses' station and people are just walking back and forth. They're busy, not saying anything. They could be very lonely. F being frustrated, not being able to um, get up to use the restroom can cause a behavior issue. Okay? Rejection. And not, you know, that's one of the behaviors that I'm not talking about today. Um, sexuality. I could teach a whole class on that one. Um, but it might be um, they were rejected, okay, um, a perceived threat. Whenever, whenever I had a staff member that came to me and said, Mildred hit me, you know what I would say to her? What'd you do to her? What did you do to her? Like I said earlier, people don't walk around like this. Okay? What did you do to her? Did you come at her too quickly? Are you trying to get her clothing off of her? Are you, are you trying to drag her into the shower? Gosh, you guys, if I didn't recognize you and you're trying to do that to me, I'd whack you too. Okay? All right, so we're going to talk about different, you know, uh, breaking tasks down in, into different steps. It's a lot easier that way. Being overstimulated. Okay, if you work with someone with Alzheimer's disease, you know after a while if the TV's on all day and there's lots of noise and people and things going on, they can become very overstimulated. Okay. Move them to a quieter place. Okay. So here's different types of agitated behavior. Frowning. Speaking loudly or yelling. Okay. Rattling doorknobs. Now a lot of times our residents with Alzheimer's and dementia, they like to fiddle with things. I don't know if you've noticed that, but they like to touch things. Okay. What we've done in our large communities, um, and I would encourage this also, is I, I put together a fiddle wall. And what I do is we put up a, a piece of uh, plywood and put a nice little cover on it. And then we'll just put things on there they like to fiddle with. For example, doorknobs, um, latches, things that have a texture to them, like sandpaper, they can touch that. They're very tactile. And they can just um, stand in front of the fiddle wall for a while. Okay? Um, acting hostile, absolutely. And agitated behavior. Shaking their fists. Okay. Speaking quickly. Being unable to relax. Okay. I hear that one personally. I, we uh, just flew in from Arizona last night. Had the, uh, the uh, what was my word here? Um, I was able to attend the uh, National Assisted Living uh, Conference. It was wonderful. I came away with a lot of new material, new information on what's going on in our industry. Um, pacing, absolutely, can cause the agitated behavior. Waving his or her arms. And this could also be they're trying to get the, your, your attention. Okay? Bringing their hands, backing away from others. Elopement, which again, again we'll be speaking about coming up here. And refusing to do a task. Now, they may be refusing to do a task because they're so overstimulated, or they might be refusing because they forgot. So what do you do if someone starts to become, to become aggressive? You need to back off. And like I said, I've been hit, kicked, scratched. It doesn't feel good, okay? But it was my own fault because I continued what I was doing. So what you want to do is you want to back off, okay? And, and if it's safe to do so, maybe you need to step out of the room, okay? Let the person take a couple breaths. You take a couple breaths. 
relax a bit, try a different tactic. Okay. Now, if the person is, is, is acting this way because they're in pain, you need to deal with this, especially if it's a UTI. I don't know if you've ever had one, but they're extremely painful and they just get worse. You cannot cure them with aspirin or cranberry juice. You need to get them to the, you know, the doctor. Don't take the patient's anger personally. And this reminds me, let me show you that. There's a really great video that is part of this series. This is the Alzheimer's Project. Has anyone heard of this before? Um, Maria Shriver, whose father, Sergeant Shriver, had Alzheimer's disease and unfortunately passed away several years ago. She got together with HBO and she created a phenomenal series. I know shaking their head. It's amazing. Uh, you can watch this free on HBO.com. Okay. Um, there's, there's three discs that I purchased. I purchased these through Amazon, okay, the Alzheimer's Project. Uh, I use disc one only. Disc two and three are very clinical. They talk about research and things, and they're kind of antiquated now. Um, but this talks about um, learning lessons from watching children and grandchildren interact with our seniors with dementia. Um, it talks about, there's a caregiving series, and there's also um, a different uh, stage series that talks that shows real people with the disease from the beginning stages all the way to actually end of life. The gentleman here um, at the end, Cousin Cliff, he actually passes away on camera. I always warn my students because I always like to show these in my classes. Um, and there is a really good lesson in here. It's called Grand Grandma Do You Know Who I Am? Or Grandpa Do You Know Who I Am? And it talks about it's not Grandma yelling at you, it's the disease yelling at you. Okay. I also, in addition to these videos, like I said, if you haven't seen these, these are really good educational videos, and they're also entertaining too. Uh, Lisa Gibbons, remember Lisa Gibbons from uh, Entertainment Tonight? Her mother has Alzheimer's, and she also has produced an exceptional video series and um, talks all about different behaviors, hallucinations, um, delusions, elopements, really, really valuable, not only for yourself, but if you um, do have staff, okay, show your staff, and also your families, okay? Sometimes the families don't get it, do they? No. So two really good, valuable um, uh, training material here. Okay. All right. Don't argue with the patient. Now, I'm calling them patient. When, in our communities, we don't like to call them patients. We call them residents. But I'm calling them patient because we have a lot of people here who... Um, are not in the field of, of assisted living. Don't argue with them. What happens when you argue with them? What happens when you try to reorient them? It just escalates, doesn't it? And who's going to win? Right. I mean, there's there actually is no winner. Okay. Maybe you get your point across and you feel like you've won, but now you've won an agitated, mad person. That's a prize, isn't it? Okay. Don't argue with them. Anyone here from Sunrise Senior Living? Okay. Um, they have this incredible philosophy that I have adopted called Join the Journey. And, and I'm going to tell you about Join the Journey here. And this is how it was explained to me. So I'm walking down the hallway with my resident. I'll call her Mildred. No offense to anyone named Mildred. Okay, M Mildred. And, uh, or no disrespect, not offense. And Mildred stops because there is a giraffe in the corner. Now, are you going to argue with her? Mildred, there's no giraffe there. You're seeing things again, honey. No, you don't say that, okay? What you do is you join the journey, okay? Mildred, is, is the giraffe bothering you? No. Okay, well, let's just walk quietly past the giraffe, right? Oh, oh, the, the giraffe is bothering you, Mildred? Okay, then let's just turn this way. Let's go back this way. Because you're not going to win trying to convince her there's no giraffe. Now, what you want to do is you want to validate her feelings, okay? But you don't want to validate what she's seeing. And here's why, okay? If you've been around people with dementia, you know that every once in a while, they have actually a pretty good, clear, cognizant moment, even in the end stages and the late stages of dementia, in Alzheimer's disease, okay? 
this might be the one time when she actually is with us. And she says, oh, and you say, oh my gosh, Mildred, you're right. It, it's huge. We, we better run because it's going to eat us. She might look at you and say, what are you talking about, crazy lady? There's no giraffe there. Okay, and then she might go back into the Alzheimer's world. Now, she doesn't remember why, but she doesn't like you anymore. She doesn't trust you. She can't remember why, but she doesn't trust you. So are you going to be successful now trying to give her a medication? No. Are you going to be successful trying to get her into the shower? No. So you want to validate the feeling or the fear or the pleasure, whatever it is, but don't validate the, the vision. Okay? They have a wonderful philosophy. I'm sure there's much more to it than that. But it's called join the journey. Okay? All right, so don't argue with the, with the person with Alzheimer's because it, it just, it's a no-win situation. Um, talk in a soft, low voice. Do not yell back. If you yell, they're going to yell, and it's just going to escalate, and then what's your prize again? Very angry, agitated person. Okay. Reduce that background noise. All right. I'm very frustrated when I walk into communities and I see the TV left on, I see people parked in front of the TV, I have the radio going, I get the intercom going, and there's just so much going on. Okay? And if possible, try to redirect the person. And we're going to talk about that when we get to the repetition, redirection. Okay? Now, another common behavior issue that we have are hallucinations, delusions, and paranoia. Okay? What is a hallucination? Well, the giraffe in the corner. Seeing, hearing, smelling things that aren't really there. Okay, that's a hallucination. Now, a delusion is an illusion that the resident has that is inconsistent with their knowledge or beliefs. Well, we had a resident in one of our communities who would um, attack her husband when, um, when he would come in. And they had a wonderful marriage. She was a wonderful, supportive husband. But what would happen was, she would see him when he came in talking to the female nurses. And I guess that little bit of insecurity, maybe, or doubt, or distrust, or whatever it was, was still there with her. And she would see that, and she would attack him out of anger. Okay? So that would be a delusion. Now, paranoia, suspicious thinking. Thinking we're poisoning them. Okay? Well, gosh, let me think about this one. So we give them, we crush their really bitter medication up, and we stick it in some, some applesauce, and then we give it to them, and they're like, it doesn't taste so good. They might actually think we're trying to poison them because it doesn't taste good. Or if they're taking a medication, that does produce kind of maybe a, a dryness to their mouth or a different taste, or a metallic taste, they might think that we're poisoning them. So that would be paranoia. Okay. All right, so what can we do to help with these behaviors? Oh, goodness, you guys. I, I'm so frustrated when I walk into an assisted living community or a skilled nursing facility, and they have the paging system. You know, Margaret, you know, call on line four. I actually saw a resident one day, bless her heart. She was standing, looking at the ceiling, and she says, God is talking to me. God is talking to me. Yeah, God's telling you it's being about four today. Yeah. No, but see, see how, I mean, the voice from above, okay, very distracting. Gosh, if you have that, please go pull the plug on that one, okay? Keep familiar objects around. Absolutely. You know, I, when our residents move into the larger communities, typically they bring a huge beacon semi-truck with the furniture coming in. When they show up at our smaller communities, our, our homes, our boarding care homes, sometimes they just show up with a suitcase and a toothbrush. They've downsized that much. Okay? I encourage people to bring in their personal belongings especially their favorite quilt, their favorite pillows, their favorite knickknacks, because it's familiar. Okay? You want to create familiarity with our residents here, especially the ones with, with Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, 
because then they won't be trying to elope, trying to go home if they can recognize the things from home. Now, changing their environment, their room as little as possible. If you're going to go in and clean their room, you put everything back in the same spot, okay? Because if they can't find something, now what? What is it now? Stolen. Stolen. Oh, no, no, it's not missing. It's stolen, okay? So, what you can do is you, you change, you know, you put everything back in the exact same spot. Or if you want to, you can even label drawers, okay? Um, if they are suspicious or if they have some paranoia issues like you're stealing from them or there's a lot of theft issues, you know, that they consider theft, clean their room when they're not in it, okay? Again, don't try to argue or reason with the resident. You're not going to win. There's no winner. Okay? And you'll notice, even in the late stages of Alzheimer's disease, they do form bonds with certain caregivers. Okay? If, if it's not working with this particular caregiver, go find the caregiver that they bond with. You might be successful. Okay? What time is it? 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 Yeah, this is my grandmother. Okay, I know I made you look, didn't I? Yeah. <laughs> what time is it? Okay, I have to make sure I'm on time too. My grandmother would do this all day long. Okay, and guess what we did? Grandma, after a while, you know, knock it off. I already told you what time it was like two seconds ago. Stop it. What time is it? Now, why do they do this? Is it because they're really trying to drive us crazy? No, and this is really something that is real, a real challenge to a lot of people. They're not trying to drive you crazy. They've forgotten. They forgot the answer, or they forgot they asked the question. So they just keep asking it. You know what we do? Redirect them. Sometimes they can get stuck on the same thing. They get real stuck on it. So redirect them. What do you do? Well, give them a snack. Give them a task. Move them to a different room. There you go, it's called redirection, okay? This is one of the hardest challenges we have is the repetition, absolutely. Wandering. Uh, you know, um, had a little snafu at the airport yesterday. The taxi driver took off with our marketing material on the taxi. And uh, we didn't realize this until we got to our rental car that he was driving around with all of our marketing stuff that we had schlepped through four different airports in 11 days to bring here. So of course we wanted it back. So I was, um, we had to pull up back to the airport again and we were trying to figure out where the cab was. Well, of course the policeman came over. Ma'am, sir, you can't park here. And uh, he wanted to know what I was doing. And I said, well, I was speaking in an Alzheimer's conference. And it was my marketing material that I really needed. And of course, then he says, oh, I, I have to tell you about my uncle. What should I do with my uncle? Because, I mean, you can have this conversation with anybody. You go to the grocery store. You talk to the clerk and say, and say hey, I'm an Alzheimer's educator. And guess what they say? Oh, can I ask you about my grandma or my mother or my son? Whatever. Because we're all affected by it, aren't we? I mean, can you name someone? Or do you know someone that's not affected by Alzheimer's disease? No, I can't. I know so many people that are dealing with this. Um, so I got to hear about his wandering uncle, and I had a really um, great suggestion for him. Uh, the Alzheimer's Association has the safe return bracelets. You know about those? Okay. Oh my goodness, do they still have those, Pam? Uh-huh. Okay, good. Okay. Um, and it's a, it's a uh, you can fill out a form, and it have, they have a bracelet. You know, it doesn't say, if lost, return to. Or on their shoe. Or in their shoe, even better. Even better. Because some people don't see that. Some people don't want that stigma of wearing that bracelet. Or on their shoe, perfect. Because you know what, you guys? They get out. And I don't know how people sleep at night sometimes, worrying about this, about them getting out. Okay? I've lost residents before. And it is the worst feeling in the entire world. It's like losing your child. Um, when you lose a resident. Um, we actually, I'll tell you my elopement story here. I got a million stories because I've been doing this for a long time. So I'm at the corporate office um, down in Irvine in Southern California one day. 
when we owned properties and we got a, a, a distress call from one of our local properties. What had happened was there was a lady who had just moved in and she was very wonderful, wonderful lady. The doctor said no diagnosis of dementia or mild cognitive impairment, she's just fine. On Wednesdays the lady t took our bus, our bus took them down to the mall, Lagoon Hills Mall, and she wanted to go. And we thought, you know, the community thought, okay, well, you know what, that's fine. So they told the bus driver um, to uh, let her know that this is the drop-off place. Please be back here at 1 o'clock, okay, and we will take you back. Well, so bus driver goes and drops them off and comes back at 1 o'clock, and there's 1, 2, 3, 4, where's Doris? No Doris. Kind of scary. So what he did, what the bus driver did, was he went in and he started, you know, put all the residents on the bus and he went in and started wandering on the mall thinking that maybe she was still there and she was looking for the bus. And um, so then he started to panic a bit and he called mall security to see if they could help out. And he called the community saying, by chance is she back there? No, okay. And then he called us, at, or then the administrator called us at the corporate office because we all had to come down and start, you know, looking for this resident. Um, that's a hard call to make to a family, too. Yeah, it's like, hey, Ann, how are you doing today? Oh, yeah, well, by chance, do, do you have your mom? No? Okay, just check it. No reason. Bye. <laughs> yeah. We were looking, okay? And so what happened was we get this phone call at the community from a gentleman. He says, hey, did, did you lose someone? What, thank the Lord, we um, gave all of our new um, residents one of those uh, stretchy little uh, rubber wristbands, you know, for their keys, and, and it says Las Palmas on it. Okay. And so what this woman had done is, I don't know if she came out at the wrong time, but she got out of the mall and went to the bus stop and got on the bus. Now it was not our bus. It was public transit. Octa. Okay. And she took the bus, I don't know how this woman did this, she took it from Laguna Hills to Whittier. If you're, if you're from SoCal, you know that's a different county. What the heck? I didn't know buses run that long. My gosh, she was on a field trip. And she got off the bus in Whittier, and some gentleman saw her wandering around and stopped and said, are you, are you lost? And he saw this wristband, and he called us. Well, there you go. And this woman did not even have a diagnosis of dementia. Okay, um, Very scary to lose, to lose someone. Um, Vintage Senior Living was another company that I do a lot of work with. I, I spend a lot of time teaching, but I also do a lot of consulting and licensing work for a lot of large properties. And years ago, Vintage bought a property in Mission Viejo that had a really not so great history. Um, in fact, we had to do a major rebranding and new signs and new advertising and everything because this, this community's history was losing a resident. He's still missing. He's still missing, you guys. They've locked, he's been gone for a good 12, 13 years. They, they haven't found him yet. Yeah. Two theories to this one. Um, the, the newspaper, of course, has their own theory, too. But I heard it from the licensing program analyst, who is the boss from the state that comes out that their theory was um, that the alarm system had deactivated and the gentleman just walked out and he fell down a ravine or fell down a hill into a, into a ravine in the back of his property and the coyotes ate him. Now, if coyotes ate you, you'd think there'd be some bones or some, some heel or shoe or something left of you. No, no, they didn't find anything like that. And then I had the program director, who was the uh, gal that was in um, charge of the memory care unit there. I was her best friend. She says, no, we think what happened was the family snuck in and took him out. And now they're suing us. There's always 
there's three sides to a story, isn't there? His, hers, and the truth. Who knows what the truth is? But this gentleman to this day is still missing. Okay. Yeah, he could be on a bus. Yeah. Yeah, he's still on a bus somewhere circling Orange County. Yeah, I would hope. I would hope. Yeah. Very scary. Okay. And, and up in this area, I was here recently um, teaching in San Francisco, and there was a gentleman from Marin County who disappeared. Did you hear about that one? 92, I think, 93-year-old gentleman who um, had dementia, still driving. Dementia, still driving. And uh, he would meet his daughter every Wednesday at Marin Joe's, which is a nice restaurant in that area. And he'd been doing this for years and years. Did it Wednesday night, Thursday, his daughter comes to, or tries to get a hold of him, and he has not made it back. And this search for him went on for quite a while, and they finally found him. Um, I think his car had gone off the side of the road and he was deceased, so very, very scary. This scares me, guys. I get people, I get my students calling me saying, should I take this resident or not? And here's what I said, can you go home at night and sleep and not worry about this person? If the answer is yes, then go ahead and take this person. If the answer is no, don't. No. Losing, a, losing, a, losing someone is, mm -mm, that's, that's, that's the worst feeling in the world. Why would someone want to wander if they live in a beautiful, nice place? Why would they want to wander? Well, they want to go home, okay? Because they don't recognize your home as their home. Okay? Even if you have their familiar, you know, familiar items around. Their home might be the home that they lived in 50 years ago, right? That they raised their children in, okay? Because you know, if you've worked with Alzheimer's residents, you know that if you told them right now it was 2014, they'd be like, yeah, sure, it's 2014, right? They've probably gone back to a different time in their life, maybe uh, 1950 or 1940 or, or whenever they grew up. That's the home they probably want to go to. All right, I got another story for you. Told you a million stories. There is a there is a community um, in the Central Valley area, and uh, one of my students was telling me this. She says we are a one horse town. Okay. She says we have two sheriffs in our town. She says I call them Dumb and Dumber. <laughs> and she says our community um, really they have the largest living facility is really the largest employer in the town. It's a very small town. And um, a woman had to move her husband into the community because he was an elopement risk, and she just she just was so tired out trying to, to you know uh, keep track of him, and she was worried about him all the time. So she moved him into the memory care unit, and of course this gentleman um, during the transition he was didn't know where he was, and what he did one day was because Alzheimer's does not take away your intelligence, guys, it just takes away your memory. He watched, and he knew when the caregivers would go clock out and the new shift would come on. So he got outside in the little outdoor court, um, courtyard area. He dragged some really heavy furniture over to the side, and he hopped the fence. Okay? So he's walking down the street, and here comes Dumb and Dumber driving in their squad car. And they say, hey, buddy, where are you going? He said, I'm going home. Really? Okay, well, how are you going to get there? I'll walk. He says, well, they said, do you have any money on you? Mm-hmm. And he had some money on him. Well, we'll call you a cab. So they called him a cab. He gave the cab driver his address. Guess what? He goes, drop, the cab drops him off, pays the cab, walks up to the door, knock, knock, knock. His very surprised wife answered the door. He says, my what a lovely house you have here. May I have a tour? Now that's, it, thankfully, he remembered that address. Okay. Um, yeah, that's, that's kind of scary, isn't it? So, and guess what? That community had not called her yet, saying, hey, do you happen to have your husband? Because we just can't find him. So she made the phone call to them. You can imagine how upset she was that she had to do that, okay? All right, um, so they want to go home. They don't recognize your home as their home. They're looking for something or someone. 
Um, we, in the Las Palmas community I was talking about down south, we had a lady who uh, constantly in the afternoon, what time is it? What time is it? What time is it? And she would, and, and she would call the front desk. Well, first, she would call her daughter. And the daughter, of course, was getting all bugged by this because she was at work. So guess what, her, guess what the daughter did? She changed the phone number to our front desk. <laughs> so the front desk was getting, what time is it? What time is it? What time is it? And of course, our receptionist was, you know, it, she was um, a very patient person, but she was starting to lose her patience with this. So we wanted to come in and investigate what's going on here. So we thought, well, maybe she needed a clock, okay, in her room, so she would know what time it was. So we bought her this beautiful big clock that she could look at. What do you think happened? Did the behavior stop? No, she couldn't tell time. So guess what we bought her? A digital one. Did that work? No, no. So what we did was we, we, we we figured out there was a pattern to this. It was always about 2, 2.15 2 in the afternoon. So we called the, the daughter and said, you know, go back in your childhood, go back in your life. D did your mom stop work at 2 o'clock? What happened around that time? And she says, the only thing I can think of is that was about the time that my mom would meet our school bus. And, and guess what, guys? Ding, 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 ding. She needed to know what time it was so she could go meet her daughter's school bus. So guess what we did? We got her real busy during that time. Okay, We took her to activities. We got her involved in things. We gave her some snacks. So it would keep her mind off of that time, and eventually the behavior went away. You learn little lessons along the way. And sometimes they work with people, and sometimes they don't. Okay. Um, this person might be wandering because they're bored, there's no stimulation, or they're hungry or they're thirsty. Absolutely, they're looking for some food. Okay. All right, um, if you have that front door open, that's a cue to leave. Okay. Um, keep the door closed. Okay. Keep things away from the door, like uh, umbrellas. Well, I guess we live in California, so we don't use umbrellas, do we? Okay. Um, coats and things that cue them to that door. Now in some memory care units that I've been to, they've actually painted the door on the inside to make it look like something like a bookshelf. Okay? Or maybe some plants or something to kind of um, distract them from that door. And you know, another good thing you can do, a couple good things, you can put a black mat. Do I see one here? No, a black mat in front of your door. Okay. Now, to you and I, we think, okay, black mat. What does that look like to someone with Alzheimer's disease, do you know? A hole. Who wants to fall into the hole? So they'll avoid it. You can also try, I've seen many things, a stop sign on the door. Okay? Or a sign, our friends use this one up in the Petaluma area. You know that sign that says, I'm closed, we'll return tomorrow, like 8 o'clock? Okay. <laughs> It worked for a while with this woman, and then finally, our friend said she stood in front of that door and said, this dang store just never opens. <laughs> All right, so you go, you try a new tactic, okay? Um, in one community, I thought this was just genius here, they actually had a stoplight. It looked like a stoplight, okay? And, and it was censored, so it was green from afar, and when someone would walk up to it, it would turn yellow. And when they got close to it, it turned red. And they would just sit there in front of the door. <laughs> waiting for the light to change. Isn't that great? Now I don't know where to find this dang thing. If you can find this, it's just, it's ingenious here. So, um, uh, and they would just stand there and it would give the staff enough time to come get them to redirect them. Because okay, I don't know, if you're, not, if, you're, if you're a caregiver at home to a loved one, you don't um, understand probably that we, <laughs> we unfortunately, in the, in the communities, if, if, if someone's wandering out and they're determined to go, we cannot grab them, physically grab them, and bring them back in. Okay? We have to throw some tennies on and go for a walk. So we learned a lot of these good techniques about redirection things in our communities. Because, I mean, I would be violating this person's rights if I actually grabbed them and tried to bring them back in. Okay. 
Okay. Oh, all right. Um, okay, so again, they, you know, the open door, they might be agitated. That's why they're trying to wander. Um, or they may have to go to work or go to school. You gotta create a sense of purpose for your residents or your loved one, okay? I can't imagine. Now, I, actually, I, I would like to have this about a day where I just sit around and I have no purpose. Or my purpose is to read a magazine. Or my purpose is to watch TV and do nothing. That doesn't happen to me too often, okay? Um, but it, sometimes we take away all of the things that they like to do. We take away the cooking and the, and the cleaning. And then they just kind of sit around. So create a purpose for them. We had uh, many nurses in our communities um, who would try to, to go to work. So what we did was we created work for them in the community. We would give them a clipboard, and we'd put some paper on it, and we'd say, okay, Nurse Jones, go do rounds. And they would go to the residents, and they would say, well, how are you feeling today, Mildred? Okay? And they would try to take their polls, and they'd ask some questions. That was their purpose. We had another gentleman who uh, really, you know, really tried to get out in the morning a lot. And we found out that he was an accountant in his, in his prior life. So guess what we did? We set up an accounting office in our hallway. We found a nice desk and a 10 key that we didn't plug in because that would have just drove us all crazy all day. <laughs> yeah, so we didn't plug it in. But we had paper and pencils and pens, and he would actually sit down in the morning after breakfast and he'd work. And he'd kind of doodle and push things around, but that was his purpose. Okay? And at lunchtime, we'd go. Oh, that was really loud. Sorry. And that would be the lunch, the lunch bell. So he'd go off to lunch and come back, and then we'd have the dinner bell, and there you go. Create a sense of purpose. Okay. Um, you need to have an elopement plan. Okay. In large communities, we're required to have this. Um, I'm gonna kind of skip along here since I have about ten minutes here. You know, maybe the person is trying to get out because you've locked them in all the time, and they're not getting out. Take them for a walk outside. Absolutely. On a daily basis, get them outside to have some fresh air. Okay. Um, maintaining routine, absolutely. Um, distract them. Ask a family member to visit or call. All right, now, wandering can be safe. It's exercise, isn't it? It helps increase their appetite. It will help them with sleep. Okay, because a lot of our residents have sleep issues, helps with the circulation, mobility. So there are benefits to wandering, but just supervised inside wandering or supervised outdoor wandering. Now again, why would someone refuse care? Why would someone refuse to be bathed? Well, several reasons. One, a lot of our residents with Alzheimer's are confused by water coming out of a wall. How does water come out of a wall? Or that little bit of water that you have at the bottom of the tub because of a visual uh, perception issue, it might look like this much instead of this much. So they might think that you're trying to drown them. Okay? Plus, it's not normal to take a shower or bath with another person next to them. And they don't recognize who you are. All of those things could cause a refusal. Okay? So what you want to do is you need to set up a routine. Okay? What did the person do in their past? Did they like to take a shower in the morning or the evening? Maintain that routine, okay? Um, did they like a bath or a shower? Now, it's, it's obviously not very safe to stick someone into a bathtub, so a shower, okay? What, what temperature water do they like? Real warm or cool, okay? And let them feel the water before you wet them. Make sure it's comfortable for them, okay? Now, if I asked this group up here, I said, if I asked you guys, um, would you like to take a bath? What might, what might you say? No? No? Well, yeah, you do. Yeah, yeah you do. You, you know, your hair's kind of funky. You just kind of smell a little bit. No, I, you need a bath. Now, because if you ask someone, they're going to say no. And then now you're in trouble because now you're going to try to convince them. Instead of asking you, just come on, come on, it's time for your bath now. And you make it a pleasurable experience. Smile on your face, have some fun. Okay? You also want to find out if they have a certain shampoo or soap or, or a scrubby, okay, or a washcloth that they like to use because that's also a cue. Now, if I smell dove soap, that to me, I automatically think of a shower. 
Okay, so find out what their preferred, um, you know, routine is. And then, of course, you want to help them maintain their dignity and self-esteem, privacy at all times. Okay, if, if someone is having an issue being naked in front of you, then great, you know what? Put some towels across their chest and their lap. And when it's time to shower those areas, you're real quick. There you go. Okay? All right. Um, and again, be sensitive to the fact that it's not normal to take a shower or bath with another person there. Okay? Um, again, you know, many different causes. Uh, mistrust of caregiver. If someone comes at the person too quickly and tries to drag them in the shower and take their clothing off, you know, they might hit you. And you know what? You probably deserve it if you're acting, if you're doing that. Okay? Now, what is a catastrophic reaction? Who here has had a two-year-old child before who does not want to do what you want them to do? <sighs> yeah. What do they do? They fling themselves to the floor, don't they? And they don't move and they just have this outburst. It's usually in public, isn't it? It never happens at home. It's always in public, you know? Our residents can feel like this also. It's called a catastrophic reaction, okay? And, and it doesn't usually, it doesn't sometimes look like a behavior that's caused by a brain illness like, like Alzheimer's or dementia. You might just think this person's being obstinate or stubborn or just being a difficult, you know, person, okay? Um, for example, my father-in-law has uh, lost the ability, or actually quite a while ago, he lost the ability to tie his shoes. So if, you're, if someone is trying to tie their shoes, say, and they can't do it, they might just, be, just become so upset by this, they might just take the shoe and just throw it. That would be considered a catastrophic reaction. Okay? Um, the best way to, to deal with a catastrophic reaction is to try to nip it in the bud before it happens. Okay? So identify the triggers of this reaction. Okay? Um, what my father-in-law did after a while is he started to mail order, I call them marshmallow shoes. Okay? Big white tennis shoes with Velcro. Right? And because you know, he didn't want anyone to know that he was losing his abilities. Okay. So what he would do is he'd order these in about two sizes too large, and he would throw them on the floor, Velcro, throw them on the floor, and slip his feet in. <laughs> Problem solved. Okay. Um, some of the triggers that can cause a catastrophic reaction can include um, it, you've overwhelmed them with commands. They're overstimulated. There's too many things going on at once. Okay. Um, they're trying to do something that they thought they could do, but they just can't. Okay. Or, or maybe someone is, is rushing them, you're trying to get out the door and you want to do it for them, or you're making them be rushed or upset, that can cause a catastrophic reaction also. Let my father-in-law not wanting to appear inadequate or unable, unable to do things, okay? Not feeling well. You know, we have to remember, our residents have bad days just like we do, okay? So what you can do, um, you know, familiar routine, absolutely. Familiar faces, find that favorite caregiver. Breaking down tasks into easy steps, one at a time. This is what I've learned. If you tell someone with Alzheimer's, hey, let's go jump in the shower, and then we're gonna get you your hair shampooed, and then, and then we're gonna get you out and towel dry you and get you dressed, and we're gonna go to lunch, they'll be like this. Deer in the headlight look because you've just totally overstimulated them with things. So what you want to do is you want to break each task down into a step. Step number one for a bath would be to go get the resident. And then you very happily, smiley, tell them, it's time for a bath now. Okay? And then you take them into the bathroom. And you say, okay, let's take off your shirt. And what you do is you take the shirt off, or have them take it off, and then you go to the next step. You break things down. You don't want to say, hey, let's get your clothes off, let's get you in here, let's get you out. Okay, so small, small steps. Wait for them to complete it, go on to the next one. Okay, and be patient. We need oodles and oodles and oodles of patience, don't we? Okay, I have extra patience. I not only work with seniors with dementia, but I also work with the state of California. <laughs> Anybody here from the state of California? Okay, it's all right, I wouldn't bad talk you anyway. No. 
I'm very, very respectful to the state of California. Okay. So, again, you know, let the resident do for him or herself um, until they show the first signs of being frustrated, and then you can step in. Okay. Um, holding someone down, patting their hands, patting them, uh, that's probably not going to fly. Okay. Uh, because physically restraining someone could, could you know, uh, could add to their panic, absolutely, or add to their agitation. How are we doing on time? Are we doing okay? Do you want to take some questions? Oh, sure. Yeah, let me see here. Yeah, okay. Well, I will let, I would love to take questions.